in general, the way you make things cool again is when high status people adopt them. So I guess if you wanted to make marriage cool again, you'd have rich men and hot women adopting it. <laughs> Simple as that. Okay. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall at Spectator. Today I'm joined by feminist theorist, columnist at Unheard, author of the book The Case Against the Sexual Revolution, A New Guide to Sex in the 21st Century, and host of the Maiden Mother Matriarch podcast, Louise Perry. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me You're today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. So I want to jump in, if I can, uh, before getting into your book and, and other such things, with what I think is a motherhood crisis. Um, and uh, perhaps it's uh, something that I'm over-worried about, but uh, the Office of National Statistics suggests that I might not be entirely wrong to be worried about it, but uh, just uh, they have reported this year that... Now, half of women are childless at 30, which is for the first time ever. This is in Britain. Mm -hmm. That 18% of women aged 45 were childless by 2020. Uh, And that mothers have, on average, 1.92 children now, which is lower than the 2.08 that their mother's generation had. Now, I think you answer some some of these issues for why this is the case in your book, which I'd like to get into, but... Uh, I was speaking to this morning to someone, and I sort of assumed that this was a bad thing. And, and his reaction was like, well, that's good. We, we need fewer people, and um, we need to have managed decline. And so what might be a very simple question is, is, why is that bad? Do we need mothers, and do mothers, do women need to have children? Yes, you don't have to look far to find people who will say that that's a great thing, um, and who will see this gradual decline in childbearing um which by the way goes back a surprisingly long way Mm -hmm. um the decline in birth rates associated with the industrial revolution um and also the decline in mortality particularly infant mortality described as the um described by by demographers as the as the first demographic transition that's when Basically, every country, almost every country in the world now has undergone the first demographic transition. Britain was the first country to do so because we were the first country to have an industrial revolution. And that's when you see uh, birth rates dropping from, you know, seven children per woman or something extraordinarily high like that to just above replacement. And then you also have low mortality and whatever. That's So, so even before the pill comes on the picture, women are having fewer children Mm -hmm. but it's in the 1960s when the pill arrives that you see this very very sharp dip Mm -hmm. in fertility and again not just here right this is i i think i'm i'm trying to recall statistics exactly only three percent of the world's population now live in a country where birth rates are not declining Mm. so declining birth rates are the norm and they started declining as i said first in britain but it's basically happened everywhere it seems to just be an inevitable consequence of modernity Mm -hmm. that people people have fewer children and there are a whole bunch of reasons associated with this um the one that you'll hear most commonly from um london millennials is that it's to do with house prices Mm -hmm. and that it it is a factor it is that it's become more expensive particularly in big urban centers like london new york san francisco tokyo wherever to own property and raise children and and there are all sorts of costs associated with children that have become greater and greater as time has gone by Mm -hmm. so that is true that's not the only factor though Mm -hmm. because if that were the only factor then you wouldn't be seeing this extraordinarily global phenomenon of falling fertility absolutely everywhere regardless of house prices um it does seem to be just something about modernity Mm -hmm. discourages family formation well, there's a few things from all angles, right? So it's the, not just the economic, which I do happen to agree with that, mm-hmm. that, that we think we want to do things in a certain order and house prices are ridiculous. That still doesn't quite answer the question, is it, do we need children? Is it bad? Is it bad? Yeah. Like, is that not, you know, in an age where we're pummeled every day and being told there's an, a climate apocalypse coming, yeah. we, the people are a problem, is it not a good thing that there, there are there are fewer people? 
So I think that um, crashing birth rates is not going to solve the climate crisis for a few reasons. One is that it takes too long, right? If the problem is that we currently have close to 8 billion people who are living in such a way that you deplete natural resources as time goes by, which I think is true. Um, having, you know, 1.5 replacement rate or something like that below below the 2.1 necessary for replacement is not going to, you know, if, if Extinction Rebellion and Co are right that we're talking about apocalypse within a century, that's not quick enough, mm -hmm. right, to actually reduce the burden on the planet. So that kind of gentle decline in population is nowhere near enough to avert catastrophe if that's your, the only tool that you're employing. So there's that. Um, the other thing is that birth rates are not declining evenly. This is something that people don't always bear in mind, right, in thinking about this. So one example that um, I wrote about actually for Unheard this week is North and South Korea. So North Korea have just below replacement level birth rates, which means that their population is likely to dwindle a little bit, but not very much in the next half century. Whereas South Korea boasts the lowest birth rates in the world, 0.78, I think it is now, whereas you need 2.1 for replacement, which means that at the moment, South Korea has twice as many people as North Korea, but in by 2100, is that how you say it? 2100, whatever, yeah, yeah. that will have reversed. So North Korea will have twice as many people as South Korea. Mm. And there are very, very obvious geopolitical consequences to that in that it's predicted that in maybe 10, 20 years, South Korea will no longer be able to repel a land invasion from North Korea because they won't have wow. a big enough military. So that's the sort of thing that we're thinking about. You know, I think what the, the fantasy of some environmentalists is that things will basically remain exactly the same geopolitically etc but people will just have slightly fewer children and eventually everything will just kind of gradually shrink no mm -hmm. what happens is that some cultures are more resistant to whatever it is about modernity that causes fertility decline mm -hmm. than are others and what we should expect to happen as time goes by is that those modernity resistant cultures are going to become more dominant and super modern secular urban etc cultures like South Korean are going to decline, mm. which is bad news if you, if, if your allegiances, as most environmentalists are, if your allegiances are with that kind of super modern secular urban culture, which is on, which is on its way out, which is committing suicide mm. effectively, because people do tend to, obviously there is some, um, th there are exceptions, but people in general do tend to adopt the, um, religiosity and politics of their parents because these things are partly heritable religiosity is a moderately heritable trait mm. um and one of the best predictors at the moment for fertility is how religious you are worldwide that's true mm -hmm. religious people just have lots more kids mm -hmm. this also applies i think to something like your interest in environmentalism you know if you're if you have the sort of personality the sort of uh um, intelligence and temperament and whatever that disposes you towards being a climate activist, there's a fairly good chance your children will as well. Mm -hmm. And also, these are the people, if, if we so if we accept my argument that actually declining population is nowhere near enough of an intervention to actually delay the climate crisis or, 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 or prevent the climate crisis, I think the only way out at this point with almost 7 billion people on the planet, almost 8 billion rather, is technology. Mm -hmm. It's better means of, 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 of energy creation. Yeah, it's the only way. Mm -hmm. there, isn't, there isn't another way. There's, have you ever heard this distinction between light greens, bright greens, and dark greens among environmentalists? No. So the light greens are the people who just think you should like, I'm, I'm, I'm straw manning a bit, but just think you should turn the tap off while you brush your teeth and just sort of like whittle around the edges hey, hey, hey. in terms of slightly reducing your consumption and that's sort of fine. So they're the, they're the least radical of, of everyone. The dark greens are the Extinction Rebellion types who say capitalism needs to be overthrown, a whole way of life is disastrous, mm -hmm. you know, who want to completely upend everything. And then the bright greens are the people who say, 
what we need is technology and innovation to get us out of this. So Elon Musk is a bright green. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right. So more people means more chance of innovation. More, yes, more particularly innovation. the type of, you know, if you if you're if you're the type of highly educated person who really cares about the environment and is going around saying I'm not going to have kids because of the planet, mm-hmm. you are exactly the sort of person who's likely to have children who are going to develop, you know, the next the next form of energy mm-hmm. that we need, yeah. you know. So I I I I think that's probably the worst thing you can do actually mm. is to refuse to procreate. Mm. And I and I also honestly think that actually most people who say that they don't want to have children because of the climate, they don't that's not actually the reason. What do you think? Well that's reason? not the whole reason. Well, because there tends to be a kind of bundle of things which feed into <clears throat> All of the things which decrease fertility, you know, things like being um, being a religious, being a graduate, living in a city, being left wing, those things also all tend to go along with being very interested in environmentalism. So there's a kind of cluster effect where the it might be. Uh, sort of politically expedient to explain your reluctance to start a family as a result of, of, of number five, the environmentalism. But it's quite likely that actually all f- all five are feeding into each other, mm. um, even if it's not quite as, um, not quite as appealing an explanation for other people or for yourself. What do you think uh, for women on a on a individual one you know each individual woman the consequences of them not having a, a child and I'll, I'll give the example of uh, recently uh, american comedian chelsea handler doing these videos of her uh, living her best life on on uh, instagram and, uh, and showing herself sort of skiing and freeing and living this luxury jet set lifestyle uh, and seemingly or claiming to be very happy, so that there is, a, and and she has a lot of support for that, certainly from progressive circles. Do you think that that uh, sh- that that suggests that actually it's great not to be a mother? Do you think that that's correct, or are, what are the flaws in that line of thinking? I mean, I think it's really good fun to be child free when you're in your thirties, and I don't think it's very good fun to be child free when you're in your eighties. So, so, so people are not wrong to recognise that going on holiday when you have small children is a nightmare. I can personally attest. I have, <laughs> I have an almost two-year-old. We've basically just given up travelling with him because it's a it's a complete nightmare. But it's, like, it's fine. Just don't do that for. It's not very long. It's not a very long period for your life when you can't go on holiday because you have small children. Um, but it is just it is straightforwardly true that they are expensive, and. Um, my friend Alex says that the um, the only thing that will limit your freedom more than having a newborn is going to prison, mm. which is true. Wow. It is just true, <laughs> right? <laughs> but also you you front load a lot of exhaustion and expense with enormous payoff. You know, at the time, babies are joyful, but also further down the track, there's an enormous payoff on an individual level. Mm-hmm. So, and so, the 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 flip side of that, if you're if you're without child later, what's what are the downsides for women specifically? Like, what? How do they? And you know, it's, I get I get the joke. If you're eighty, it's and you have no children, it's sad. But can you explain that to people who maybe don't understand that? Um, it is very common for women in particular, and men too, to regret not having children later. It is very common. There are exceptions to that. But I think in general, it is probably a good policy when mapping out your life to basically behave as other people behave because the chances of you being an outlier are quite low. Mm -hmm. Most Most people will not derive great meaning in their lives from their careers. Mm-hmm. Most people will derive great meaning from their children. Mm-hmm. That's just true. There are exceptions, but that's just true for most people. And it is fun to have the freedom that comes with not having children when you're younger. But when you're older and you are more likely to be lonely, when you are dependent on other people for support, you know, 
you can't depend if, when you're in your 80s you can't depend on other 80 year old friends to look to look after you in the way that adult children can mm. and also you probably aren't going to be able to depend on the state either because that's the other story in relation to falling fertility the welfare state is a ponzi scheme mm -hmm. it always was mm. <laughs> right like when when the old age of pension was introduced when the nhs was introduced we had a much younger population on average we had we had much higher birth rates and no one ever expected these things to become I think six and six percent and seven percent respectively of GDP mm -hmm. which they are now mm -hmm. no one ever expected that but it's already clear that state pensions and the NHS and the whole the whole welfare state is not sustainable that's only going to get worse with the child uh, decrease it's only going to get worse yeah so I think the chances of me I'm now 31 the chances of me getting to claim my state pension when I'm 68 which I supposedly will be able to do are non-existent hmm. pretty much I think it would be gone by then you you touched on one of the first lies of feminism in that answer is that, that a career uh, sorry yeah well I think this is you can challenge me if you disagree but that, that a career is more meaningful than having children and, and something I've noticed in my generation is is for women it's they've been told to pursue a career to go to university to go and seek work and and um uh, but you claim or you're arguing that no that's actually not it's not good for women i think that's probably true for men too i think the vast majority of people have jobs not careers mm -hmm. and that's actually as it should be Mm -hmm. so it's 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 weird intellectual types like me who, <laughs> you know who define themselves by their careers it's um that's not typical and i don't think it ever should be um most people derive most meaning from their families and their friends and their local communities and you know there's so much data supporting this this view that the things that make people actually happy are basically meaningful connections with other people mm -hmm. not abstract things like intellectual success or career success mm -hmm. um yes but that that has been um a very dominant view in feminism for some time that women ought to be prioritizing the life of the mind or the um success according to traditionally masculine criteria mm -hmm. ought to be the goal um I think that partly comes from the fact that sort of inevitably the women who have the greatest power in setting the cultural agenda and the political agenda are women who have chosen that route and for whom that route may be a better fit for them. You know, there are there really are outliers in every direction. There will be some women who have absolutely no interest in having children, for whom it probably wouldn't be good to have children because it's not you know, they wouldn't make good mothers. They're not, they're not orientated in that direction and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and who are very driven in their careers and are just temperamentally kind of more masculine, right? Mm -hmm. Those women are so much more likely to be at the top of the tree when it comes to um, powerful institutions. Like female politicians, for instance, are, are so much more likely than, than the average woman to not have children, enormously so inevitably those women are going to be just a bit less interested in the alternative route and in promoting the interests and the viewpoints of women who've chosen to stay at home. I mean, stay at home mothers are probably the least represented demographic in the whole of the country uh -huh. in political terms, right? Because by definition, they're not in the corridors of power. Do you think it's that it, within feminist, different feminist movements as well, though that there has been a tendency to try and strive for women to live equal lives to men rather than embracing the great things about womanhood because it's not necessarily just the women who are in top in, in certain careers who are as you say outspoken and vocal have have the opportunity to speak but the whole various feminist movements it seems to be trying to level the playing fields in a way that is against female nature i mean in in your your book, you, I think you, you write, feminism needs to rediscover the mother. I'm not entirely convinced to ever embrace the mother. Yeah. Do you think that's, do you think that's fair? Um, yes. I mean, so there have, feminism historically very complicated political movement and there are lots of different warring factions. Um, there have been strains of so-called 
maternal feminism or difference feminism or whatever, which um, I'm to some extent drawing on. But in terms of the, the the most dominant feminist ideas, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a there's an antipathy to motherhood, and that I think is kind of built in to the ideology because um, liberalism is really hard to to reconcile with motherhood, and so to the extent that feminism is derived from liberalism as the sort of grounds of political movement. If if your priority is the freedom of the individual, and if your unit of analysis is the individual, how on earth do you deal with motherhood? Because babies aren't really individuals, huh. right? Because they can't they can't survive for even an hour without the devoted care of at least one adult, and mothers aren't really. Certainly mothers, when they have newborns, aren't really individuals either. I've heard from so many women who've had newborns that going out of the house for the first time without your baby feels like missing a limb. That's the phrase I've heard mm. so many times. Mm. And that's how I felt as well. And it, it eases over time. You have this kind of gradual process of, of feeling more um, separate from your baby. But certainly in the early days, mother and baby are a unit. And if you, and if your understanding of society is as is is of individuals sort of like atoms just occasionally bumping into one another, but basically operating solo, what do you do about the mother baby dyad? It just doesn't really make sense. And so your options are basically to to be antinatalist to just say, well, it's better for women if they don't have children. And some feminists are very explicit in saying that. Um, not realizing, I guess, or not thinking about the fact that that's a surefire way to, to, to for your, your movement to commit suicide, <laughs> right? If you're, if the people drawn to your movement end up not reproducing, then you rely on converting other people's children to the ideology. Mm -hmm. But that's quite hard. You know, you will you will eventually run out of other people's children to convert. So there's that. The other option that's been chosen by some feminists is to um, rely as much as possible on the state and to say that we should be um, we should be trying to disrupt that intense link between mother and baby and using state services to that end so universal daycare from birth sort of thing mm -hmm. um, and uh, rather than having women supported by spouses, having women supported by the state. That's the kind of socialist feminist route um, as a way of dealing with this problem of freedom. Mm. How do we maximize women's freedom? Um, Which do you support? Neither. What's your solution? <clears throat> I think it has to be the family. I think, it's, I think it's a pick your poison situation, I do. Because I do recognize that there are downsides to um, having women be reliant on the family network for support during the vulnerable periods of pregnancy and, and babyhood. But I also think that there isn't a better alternative because I don't think that the state makes a better replacement family. I don't. I think it's worth saying that I don't think that the nuclear family should be the only source of support. I think that historically the norm for humans has been to be embedded within extended family networks and to have, say, lots of female kin mm -hmm. um, flock around. That it used to be a practice in the UK. Um, I did um I I did a degree in women's history and my dissertation topic was on um the history of of obstetrics in this country. And um I don't know that word. What is that? Obstetrics. Childbearing. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and there used to be um, all sorts of practices we've completely forgotten about, which mm -hmm. were completely standard. Like, for instance, the lying in period. Have you ever heard of the lying in period? No. Where women would basically spend, I can't remember exactly the period, it's something like 30 or 40 days. They After birth, they would spend being looked after by other people in their homes, basically. So this is obviously pre-hospitals. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you, at the end of that period, you are churched. You go to your local parish church, and there is a there's a um, a, a 
a service, and then you're sort of released from your lying in period. And this is occasionally being interpreted by some feminists as this sort of almost like putting women in perda, like a women are sort of shut away because they're dirty or whatever. That's not the purpose of the lying in period. The purpose of the lying in period is to protect you and the baby from infection because you're not going out and about and risking disease and also to allow you to recover from this you know, horrible experience of, of, of completely unanesthetized childbirth. Mm. Um, and what's really interesting about um, that practice is, is pretty much all cultures have something like that and it's mm. all for about the same period of time as well. Mm. If you look at the... Um, whatever they call it, lying in period of different cultures. It's all like 30, 40 days-ish. Mm. And the, the way that it's done is that you have your female kin or sometimes your female friends or servants, if you can afford them, will come and look after you during that period and will do everything for you. Mm-hmm. That seems to be among most cultures mm-hmm. the solution that is arrived at in terms of how do you support mother and baby during that really vulnerable period, particularly, of course, in periods of high infant mortality. Um, and we don't do that. I was kicked out of hospital after less than 24 hours wow. after having a cesarean. Yeah. And in hospital, I had basically no support from anyone. And, had, and in fact, I mean, I to be fair, I had baby during lockdown, but I wasn't I wasn't allowed even to have my any of my relatives with me in hospital. So, like, we've completely done away with that. And I think no wonder women get such bad postnatal depression mm. because we've basically we've just done away with the with the village mm. that exists for precisely this purpose and, and just left everyone the to in, their own devices with the, so this is from the industrial revolution basically yeah, and, that's, yeah. and that's where the big change so the the fix for that is cultural then it's not really political what what can the state well, really do to encourage that change in uh, in in looking after mothers there there are some things that the state probably can do i don't think that um what the state currently encourages is for people to be as mobile as possible in terms of internal and also international migration in order to maximize GDP. And also for um, the state doesn't really recognize the extended family. It's just blind to it Mm. in general. How could it recognize it? One example I like to give is I have a friend who um, had a baby when she was at medical school, a single mum, and she somehow managed to finish her degree miraculously. And then she was getting to the stage of applying for her placements as a junior doctor. And she really, really wanted to be located near where her mum lives because she wanted to live with her mum and rely on her mum for childcare, particularly overnight, because overnight nurseries are closed. What are you supposed to do if you're doing a night shift as a doctor? And the NHS bureaucracy just couldn't compute this idea. They were like, okay, so if you have if you have a child in primary school, they respect that as a sort of geographic limitation. Mm-hmm. And if you have a spouse, they'll 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 recognise that. But they this idea of like a grandmother or what is just sort of yeah. there's no drop down menu option for that because that just doesn't sort of figure in policymaking mm-hmm. in general. Um, I think it should. I think that we should be thinking about trying to strengthen the extended family in all policymaking. Um, and currently it's off the radar. So, yeah, it's not as if the state can just wave a magic wand and, and return us to um, the medieval village mm-hmm. arrangement. But I think at the moment it does things that further undermine the family when it needn't. Like like that, but uh, what? how else? So one example, it sounds niche. The fastest growing type of household in this country is the multi-generational households, i.e. three generations living in the same house. So for economic reasons, because of the housing crisis? Or yeah, living. so it's partly, to do with, it's partly to do with young people not being able to afford to buy their own property, so they're staying at home for longer. It's also partly to do with older people just living for such, such a long time. Mm that it can be the best option for a family to have, you know, to have a granny flat or whatever and to have um, an elderly person move in. Um, it's also quite a good arrangement when it comes to childcare, potentially, if you've got um, an older relative living with you who can help sort of around the edges in terms of um, childcare, then that's can be quite a good arrangement for people. Um, part of the reason that it's growing 
as a household type in this country is because of South Asian communities are much more likely to adopt that practice and not not necessarily because of poverty it's not like there's no direct correlation between choosing that option and being poor it's actually because it's culturally considered normal to have your elderly parents live with you rather than have them in institutions um there are all sorts of really dumb barriers to multi-generational households mm -hmm. right things like just getting planning permission to build a granny annex or whatever or it's difficult to get a mortgage because there aren't bespoke mortgage products available at most high street banks when you've got, you know, so you've got one generation who have a lot of equity, but basically no capacity to raise a mortgage. And then you've got another generation who might not have as much equity, but can pay off the mortgage over a longer period. Like that's just the sort of thing that high street banks struggle with. They needn't, there's nothing inherently difficult about that. It just needs um, potentially some, some quite small policy tweaks. Mm -hmm. um, but until now, I don't think government's really been used to thinking in those terms about how to actually knit families together <laughs> rather than just encourage people to maximize their their earnings at all times. One of the brilliant pieces in your book, which, which, which I think is one of the contentious issues of today in feminism is, is the idea, uh, and I think you use the term uh, equal above the head. Uh, so, um, have you have you had? I imagine you've had pushback from that particular point because that seems to be something that people disagree, disagree with, and um, but it seems obvious to me that that biologically we are different and that hormones would have had different effect, have different effects on men as they do to women. And and um, what do you think? Why do you think that's such a contentious uh, issue? And wh why is that so problematic for fem feminists? The word that I've some that I've heard quite a few times is that I'm being defeatist in thinking that there are ways in which men and women on average psychologically differ, differ from one another and that those differences aren't going to go away. Um, that is seen as kind of giving up, just accepting, crucially accepting male violence, you know, mm. just saying that, well, men in every time and place that we know of have always been more aggressive than physically aggressive than women um so it's actually not really about women it's about it it's sort of an apology that men behave badly if, if you accept that it's not really to do with yes i think it's also seen to be feeding into i mean you know there are historically instances of um scientific sexism shall we say you know what does it what, what like um there was i can't remember the exact number now but um, women's brains on average are smaller than men's brains because women are on average smaller than men. And um, there were some Victorian scientists who got very preoccupied with the idea of, I think it's the missing five ounces. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, so trying to explain women's kind of cognitive inferiority on the basis of just brain size. Um, I mean, we now know that actually average male and female IQ is the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that was... That was dodgy science, yeah. but there clearly there clearly have been examples of of scientific sexism being mm -hmm. put to that end, and so some feminists hear me going around saying that men and women have important psychological differences, and mm -hmm. they that's that's the fear that that's where that heads um, towards just legitimising the mistreatment of women. How do we overcome that fear? I think the problem is that it's true. What's true? that there are differences between men and women psychologically. Uh -huh. It's just true. And it sort of doesn't matter whether or not you think that that truth might be misused by bad actors. Mm -hmm. It is just true. And I think that, I don't think we solve anything by trying to pretend otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think also that when you withdraw from a discipline like say evolutionary psychology, which most feminists are very su suspicious of, what you end up doing is having no ability to contribute to that discipline you know if anyone with a kind of feminist inclination rushes out of the discipline you sort of leave it to the you leave it to the bad actors mm -hmm. right you're likely to actually produce more dodgy <laughs> anti-feminist science because exactly. you just you've just you've, you've given up I, I mean that's defeatist arguably right yeah i think we should say the science is morally neutral if it's true it's true 
what we decide to do with that truth is up to us. We can put it to whatever political ends we want to. And and I think that actually there are ways in which you can use, say, evolutionary psychology to ends that um, promote the interests of women, which How? is what I'm trying to do. So what would be an example of that? So on the sexuality issue, for instance, which I write about at length, um, there's copious evidence to suggest that male and female sexuality on average is innately different mm -hmm. and men are for instance more likely to be interested in casual sex than women sociosexuality are. Is that sociosexuality yeah. yeah so that's your your innate tendency towards being interested in sexual variety mm -hmm. men are higher in that trait than women there's lots of overlap you know it's something that um often really clever people are bad at understanding is the idea of overlapping bell curves mm -hmm. and the idea that you can be you can have at the population level you can have a difference but there can still be individuals for whom to whom that doesn't apply really smart people can completely lose their senses when confronted by this but yeah. that's that's what we're talking about in when it comes to sociosexuality and indeed much else um i don't think it serves women's interests to pretend as i think we have done for half a century now that the only reason that women don't like casual sex as much as men is because they've been repressed and that if only women could be freed mm. from that repression. That's the other great lie of feminism, it seems. Yeah, and that they could have sex like men and that this is what women really, truly want mm -hmm. underneath all of the sort of patriarchal nonsense. Um, I don't think that's true. And evolutionary psychology would support that view. It's, it should be very obvious intuitively why the sex who, who, who risk much more mm -hmm from any sexual encounter in terms of pregnancy in particular, why they would be the pickier sex and why mm -hmm. they would be less keen to jump into bed with someone they don't know. Um, and if, if, you, if you can accept that premise, then the distress that is widely reported by young women in particular as a consequence of hookup culture can be understood not as the sort of vestiges of patriarchal sexual repression still playing out when women are slut shamed. You can see it, see it instead as a completely um, good and natural response from women who are actually being put under pressure to have sex that they don't really want to have. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, if we're really interested in protecting those women's well-being, <laughs> I think continuing to try and make them behave more like men is not going to do that. Uh, and actually, you argue for the for marriage as the as a tr trying to bring very back. controversially yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes so the feminist case for marriage yeah which is which i've written for the for the spectator as well yeah. um which is that if you're going to have children particularly the the data suggests and history suggests that the only stable institution that has proven itself to actually protect the interests of women and children is marriage, mm -hmm. monogamous marriage. And basically all cultures, basically all cultures either opt for monogamous marriage or polygamous marriage. So one man, multiple wives. What, one fact from your book that I found really surprising was that historically only 15% of, of cultures have um, monogamous uh, relationship as the norm. Have men dated monogamous? So what quite a lot of cultures do is they permit polygamy, which is not to say that every marriage is polygamous, but they permit it. Um, Christian cultures, for instance, don't. Uh -huh. okay. And that is the unusual. That's the unusual one. Okay, sorry, yeah. but I interrupted you. So uh... well, And polygamy is bad news for women in general. Um, there are loads of... Domestic violence is higher in polygamous cultures, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, child abuse is, is more common. Um, there's higher crime rates because you've got all these um, unmarried angry men who are more likely to commit opportunistic crimes. Um, monogamous marriage has a whole bunch of downsides, but at the societal level, we haven't yet found a better structure. Mm -hmm. And various experiments, you know, by um, utopians having sort of, I don't know, commune. I mean, one of the things that Jermaine Greer for instance, imagined in the female eunuch, um, published in the 70s, 1970, was um, 
having women living in sort of communes with one another and then men might visit occasionally, you know, all of these kind of experimental setups. Um, they've never lasted. People have tried them at various points in history, not just post sexual revolution. And um, they don't seem to work. They don't actually seem to accommodate human nature in the way that you need them to. Well, so as well as what I think we have, a, a mother, motherhood crisis, we also have a marriage crisis. And I, I think it's something like the, the, now that the, fir, the average age for a woman to be married for the first time is in, the, I think it's 32. Yeah. And for a man, it's 34. And in your book, you go into uh, detail about that, really from the 1969 Divorce Act and how drastically things have changed since then. I think uh, you, you go into, if I remember correctly, and correct me where I'm wrong, it's uh, back in 1968, 8% of children were born out of wedlock, and now it's 50% of children are born out of wedlock. So sounds that, about right. Sounds about right. Yeah. So uh, marriage has completely, as an institution, been worn away. And, and how, how, how can we change that culture if, if indeed... Uh, polygamy is worse for us, as you've argued. How do we change it and make and make marriage cool again? Um, <clears throat> well, in general, the way you make things cool again is when high-status people adopt them. Mm -hmm. It's true for basically everything. So I guess if you wanted to make marriage cool again, you'd have rich men and hot women adopting it. Like simple as that okay <laughs> i mean that's just true those are the those are the, the quickest routes to status okay. in, in among human beings um uh, i don't know how we do that D designing designing that particular policy i i guess i will leave well okay so then how do you win it? How, how do you win that argument with <laughs> with the with let's say in feminist circles or, or how how do, in in the in the disc, in the discourse how do we persuade marriage as as the the worth redeeming well, I mean, one of the things that's worth noting is that um, the richer you are, the more likely you are to get married and stay married. Really? Yeah. And so the poorer you are, why? So if you're poorer, you're less likely to. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. There are different. There are different views on it. Huh. The if you come across Rob Henderson's idea of luxury beliefs. No. So Rob Henderson is um, a psychologist, writer, very yeah. interesting very interesting person and he um is best known probably for his idea of luxury beliefs so this is he defines it as um a belief that confers status on the upper classes while the costs are borne by the lower classes and he compares it to a um a sort of an ideological veblen good so a veblen good is um a good that is more desirable because it is expensive. So like a Rolls Royce, and defying the normal laws of supply and demand, a Rolls Royce is desirable because it's expensive, because everyone knows it's expensive. You can only access it if you're very rich, mm -hmm. right? Um, Rob thinks that this also applies to political ideas. So if you can hold to an idea that is actually very, very costly for you know, not for you, but for, for someone less privileged than you, it actually is a way of boosting your own status and advertising your own your own status. So an example he gives, for instance, is um, uh, drugs. If you go around saying that you want drugs to be completely legalized, you don't understand all the stigma about drugs, whatever. Um, if you live in a nice expensive part of town, and you can afford to go to very expensive rehab, that doesn't cost you anything. But it does cost someone who lives in a very poor part of town and is likely to have, you know, the house broken into by junkies and to have needles in the child's playground and whatever. It costs them a great deal. So it's a luxury belief in the sense that it is a way of boasting about your own status without suffering any costs. Mm -hmm. And I think marriage may be an example of, well, sorry, opposition to marriage may be an example of that. I was just thinking of Chelsea Handler as a perfect example of that. Yeah. But boasting about privilege without showing any of the costs yeah, that it's yeah. going to be for her. Because the people disproportionately who suffer from family disintegration are poor people, particularly poor women and children. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it was, um, I can't remember who, who said this. Not me. I'm stealing it from someone, but I can't credit them because I've gone. He said, um, the real losers from the sexual revolution weren't men, weren't women, they were children. Mm. I think that's true. There's so much evidence to suggest that divorce is a complete disaster for children. Yeah. En masse. Um, like it's worse for your parents to get divorced than for one of your parents to die. In really? terms of the impact on children psych- psychologically. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, uh, so, uh, then what does the uh, uh, future look for feminism? What do you, wh- how, are you, now Mary Harrington has just put out her book, Feminism Against Progress, and she cites you at length, which I imagine is very flattering. Do you, is, there, <laughs> is, there, uh, a, 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 is there a sort of comeback uh, for traditional or conservative feminism? So the term that Mary has coined is um, not conservative feminism, but reactionary feminism. Mm-hmm which is partly a joke um, because it's funny and because, you know, you're preempting what people are going to say about you, yeah. um, sort of reclaiming the word reactionary, which is funny. Um, but it's also, it, I think it does also describe quite a serious political idea. The problem with describing this program as conservative feminism is it suggests a slightly different relationship with the recent past. It suggests that what you're trying to do is cling on to the status quo. Whereas actually, as you know, in relation to marriage, for instance, um, what is there to cling on to? It's already dead. You know, mm. the idea that we're going to sort of just um, stand with thought history yelling stop and that's enough. You know, that what we're actually thinking about here is a, is almost a reconstruction process. And I think, I mean, reactionary feminism is 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 basically just a funny meme that became a a, a serious political idea but i think it, i think i think part of what reactionary feminism describes and what i see as being part of what i'm trying to do is recognizing that there are lots of ways in which our current cultural moment is very very strange there are all sorts of things that we do which are very odd and are largely a result of our material circumstances the fact that technological processes progress has been so rapid People haven't really kept pace with it in terms of our social institutions. And this kind of liquefying effect that technological progress has on communities and traditions, whatever. What what I think the reactionary feminist says to this is, okay, we don't say, well, let's recreate the 1950s then. You know, let's, let's look to the fairly recent past and say, that's she almost goal. goes back to the medieval period. right yeah right. yeah so yeah she goes so really exactly so super trad <laughs> yeah so mary so mary for instance would argue and did argue in a great essay she wrote years ago from which feminist against progress is partly derived um trad wives aren't trad enough yeah <laughs> because actually yes it's she very convincingly argues that actually women um were probably better off in pre, pre-industrial revolution on some metrics. On some metrics, yeah. <laughs> no. Not on all. But definitely this idea of progress being a straight line mm-hmm. is nonsense. Um, I think what the Reactionary Feminist Project is, is to look across time and place, mm-hmm. you know, ambitiously, not just look back to the 1950s, and say, okay, what are the common themes here? What are the, what are the norms, institutions, ideas, whatever, that seem to best promote human flourishing? What do all cultures end up settling on? We spoke about the lying in period. You know, if everyone's doing this Mm. except us, is that because we are uniquely enlightened? Or is that because actually we're the ones who've gone astray? Mm. Should we be should we be returning to the lying in period? Should Mm. we be trying to actually sort of reconstruct from from the past Mm -hmm. ways of structuring human life which actually promote women's interests, promote everyone's interests better than what we do right now. That's, I think, what reactionary feminism is. And, and you, people seem to be quite into it. <laughs> I, I, uh, do you take issue with any of uh, Mary's uh, thoughts on it? Where do you think you divide from? Are you split from her? Um, I joke that it is also true that I'm Mary's gateway drug. You know, she's a, she's a, more, she's a more radical thinker than I am in certain ways. But then I think that's so valuable because she... She follows some of these ideas through to their most Overton window pushing conclusions. Like no sex for marriage. 
So Mary, for instance, has a whole chapter where she argues against the pill, mm -hmm. which I didn't quite do in my mm -hmm. book. I, I, I present some of the arguments against the, well, I, I present some of the ways in which the pill has caused some social destruction. And I push for some degree of kind of restraint, but Mary goes the whole way. Uh -huh. So right. you're still quite in favor of the, of, of that, of contraception in that, in that sense. It's not, she, you, you think there's, there's still plus sides, but whereas Mary's kind of get married first and, you know, it's, it's basically strict Christianity, it seems like. Uh, yeah. Orthodox Christianity without the Christianity, without Christ. Yeah, sort of reconstructed from first principles, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I don't... I use contraception within marriage, but like, I don't... I, actually, I don't want to get rid of the pill. It's really useful. <laughs> it's basically my view. While simultaneously recognising that there have been destructive effects. Well, you social have, a, consequences. I think, pretty much a whole chapter... Yeah, saying yeah, yeah, the yeah. massive consequences of the pill. Yeah, so some people would say I'm a hypocrite. Maybe they're right. <laughs> Great, well on that note. <laughs> uh, Louise Perry, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Thank you. <laughs>